finally, Shackran felt that they had to get onto their boats and make for an island to escape from the ice. The problem then was, where were they going to go? And there's an intriguing collection of island silhouettes which Worsley took with him, so that when they saw a bit of land, they knew where they were. Because otherwise, how do they know what they're going to see? Their navigation, however brilliantly it was done, was primitive. And they embarked on this boat journey from the ice, not knowing where they were going to end up. Several landfalls were possible. Closest were Clarence and Elephant Islands, some 100 miles to the north. But Deception Island, over 150 miles to the west, was known to have supplies for shipwrecked mariners. Shackleton chose Deception Island. Their three small lifeboats would carry all 28 men on a journey that would last no one knew how long. Sailor William Bakewell recalled the anxious day of departure. Our first day in the water was one of the coldest and most dangerous of the expedition. The ice was running riot. It was a hard race to keep our boats in the open leads. We had many narrow escapes from being crushed when the larger masses of the pack would come together. During the first few days of their journey, they beached their boats on the ice each evening to sleep. Hurley had no film camera and few photos to spare, so expedition artist George Marston recorded their tenuous camps on the wandering floes. Leonard Hussey and Walter Howe later relived a night when disaster struck. We were drifting over the sea on a piece of ice and we were cold and frozen pitch dark night once and then the ice split right across under the men's tent with well, the eight of us turned in there one poor chap name of Holmes him and his sleeping bag dropped into the drink Shacklin looked into the crack and he saw a man floating in his sleeping bag in the freezing water he would live only minutes Shackleton grabbed Holness and yanked him still in his bag up onto the floe Seconds later, the ice edges locked together again. I remember Shackram saying to Holness, are you all right? Yes, sir, he said, I'm quite all right. Only thing I regret, my bloody tobacco's down there in the drink. Shackleton acknowledged other miseries. Constant rain and snow squalls blotted out the stars and soaked us through. Occasionally the ghostly shadows of silver, snow and fulmer petrels flashed close to us. And all around we could hear the killers blowing, their short sharp hisses sounding like sudden escapes of steam. My father said that at the end of a watch, your hands had to be chipped off the oars. And it's very hard to imagine what it must be like when you try to get some sleep. Your hands must be totally frozen, your clothes are probably soaked, and you're hungry. The days passed in painful rowing and bailing. There was no stable ice to camp on, so nights were spent floating helplessly in the Black Sea. To add to their troubles, many of the men suffered from dysentery and hunger. 
My father, in one of his very, very few comments he ever made to us as children, always said that that journey from the ice to Elephant Island was, for him, the worst part of the expedition. I think they only had one hot drink a day, and he said that they only ate a ship's biscuit, which in his own phrase, you look at for breakfast, you suck it for lunch, and you eat it for dinner. What kept them from cracking was Shackleton's sheer willpower, his leadership, this flame that burns within him. And this was manifested in different ways. <clears throat> Either it was Shackleton playing the consummate mariner at the prow of the boat leading his little squadron to safety or it was mothering his men um, suddenly turning round and comforting somebody or preparing food for him and acting basically like a hen with one chicken and then the next minute he was a martinet driving his men on it's hard to imagine and yet they probably were seeing things of great beauty on that journey. We were all laced together, the three boats, on account of the bad weather. And during the night, the several whale, I don't know what species, were blowing around us. Had they gone over one of our tow ropes, the three boats would have certainly disappeared. And also us. The helmsman steered for days and nights with no sleep. When Worsley was relieved from crouching at the tiller, he had to be laid flat and opened out from his jackknife position. Some of the men broke down and wept, overwhelmed by misery and fear. Shackleton knew he must make for the nearest land at once. They altered course for Elephant Island. On the evening of the sixth day, the skies to the northwest darkened and a gale swept down on them. One of the lifeboats was swamped and in danger of sinking. Orderlies, who until then had disdained to row, rose to the crisis. My grandfather was always a man who wanted to do a feat. Rowing, you're, you're, there's no possibility of, of doing a feat. I mean, everybody's on the same oar, rowing like that, bailing out, saving everybody's lives. Gosh, I mean, that, that's sort of... A, car, a, a part made in heaven for my grandfather because everybody would be made aware of the fact that he'd been up all night bailing them out. So, gentlemen don't row, but by Jove, they'd do anything necessary to save people's lives. After a week, they were nearing the end of their resources.